30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. I'm Harriet Watson, a member of the City Club of Portland's Board of Governors. And it's my privilege to welcome you to this very special Friday program in a very special venue, the Newmark Theater of the Portland Center for the Performing Arts. Today's program is co-sponsored by the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies in cooperation with the City Club's Art and Culture Issue Committee and is the lead-off event in the committee's six-part series on arts and the public value. Our featured speaker today is William Ivey, the new chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. But first, some brief announcements. The second event in the Arts and the Public Value series will be a breakfast program with former Wyoming Senator Alan Simpson. That program is this coming Wednesday, November 18th at the Hilton Hotel. Reservations and prepayment are required, and today is the last day for reservations. If you are interested in attending, please call the club office this afternoon. Next Friday, November 20th, you are invited to join us at the Multnomah Athletic Club for a very special program with City Commissioner Gretchen Kafori. Gretchen will deliver her valedictory address and give us all a chance to celebrate her tremendous legacy to our city and state. Our Public Services and Safety Issue Committee is recruiting new members as well as looking for a co-chair to serve with Jean Olson Myers. The committee meets the third Wednesday of each month at noon at the club office. Their program next Wednesday will feature Thomas Bruner, director of the Cascade AIDS Project. For more information, please call the club office. And lastly, an important public service announcement from PCPA management. Please stow your box lunches under your seats after you're done. And now to today's program. Seated with me are Barbara Russo, President of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, who will be introducing our speaker, and our member host, Leslie Toomey, Co-Chair of the Arts and Culture Issue Committee and Director of Individual Gifts for the Oregon Symphony. She will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Leslie's question, we will open the program to questions from other City Club members and Arts Assembly Conference attendees. Please line up behind the microphone even before Leslie is finished so that we can avoid any lag time between questions and have time for as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a City Club member or conference attendee before asking your questions. And always a challenge, please limit your question to 30 seconds. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from Lane Powell Beers Lebersky, Weyerhaeuser, and CH2M Hill. We are grateful for their support and for their commitment to the City Club's mission to inform members and the community in public matters and to arouse in them a realization of the obligation of citizenship. It is in this context that we might choose to look at our support of the arts as a canary in the coal mine. I was in a discussion last night with a composer and critic who talked about the challenges of composing in terms of mental agility and imagination, problem solving, and taking risks by pushing out ideas as far as they will go. Friends of his who are mathematicians and physicists tell him that there is an inherent consonance between his creative process and their modes of thinking. At their core, the arts are about the ascendancy of ideas, about asking questions and thinking critically. As such, they contribute immeasurably to the common good and to the healthy functioning of a free democratic society. But most of the people in this room and all of them up on stage with me can speak with much more knowledge and authority on these matters than I can. Barbara Russo, president of the National Assembly of State Agencies, most certainly can. 
Barbara is Executive Director of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a position she's held since 1991 and has just completed three years service as Chairman of the Board of the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. Over the years, her work in support of the arts has been recognized in many ways. As a recipient of the New Jersey Governor's Award for Arts Education, an invited speaker at the Getty Center for Education in the Arts Fifth National Conference in Washington, D.C., and as co-chair of the State Activities Task Force of the National Goals 2000 Arts Education Partnership. It is my pleasure to now turn the program over to Barbara Russo, who will introduce today's featured speaker, William Ivey. Thank you, Harriet, and thank you, Leslie. I would also like to extend our sincere thanks to the City Club of, Club of Portland. We appreciated the opportunity to work together to plan this event, and we're delighted to bring together the civic leaders of Portland with arts leaders from around the country. Jonathan Katz, Director of National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, often describes us as a national network with local reach. This gathering certainly helps to illustrate that and suggest our great potential when we work in partnership toward common goals. I also want to extend our thanks to the Portland Center for Performing Arts for making it possible to gather in this beautiful theater for this event. Now at this time it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Bill Ivey has served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts for only a few months and yet, in joining us today, he does so already as a friend. As most of you know, he came to the endowment with 20 years of experience providing leadership for the Country Music Foundation in Nashville. Now, Chairman Ivey, just so that you know that we are serious when we talk about the ability of NASA to engage our network of state arts agencies, you should know that the minute your appointment was announced, we immediately swung into action to get the real scoop we called Bennett. <laughs> now Bennett is our esteemed, soft-spoken, oh-so-discreet and ever-so-humble director of the Tennessee Arts Commission. And we called him because we greatly value his opinion. And here's what we learned. In his years with the Country Music Foundation, Bill Ivey demonstrated exemplary leadership that bridged nonprofit and profit-making worlds. The arts and humanities, the popular and the scholarly, his vocation as an executive, his avocation as a musician. At NASA, we recognize increasingly the importance of bridging these worlds in the way that Bill Ivey's work exemplifies. We also learned that Bill Ivey has great strength in planning. So it should surprise no one that the strategic plan drafted under his supervision at the NEA calls for a collaboration with state arts agencies to achieve every one of the endowment's goals. It also states a clear intention to draw purposefully on the information collected by NASA from all of you through the national standard for policy development, planning, and performance measurement. It appears that this NEA chairman's field of vision includes precisely the strategic alliance and working relationships that the state arts agencies hope to have with our federal partner. We look forward to our work together to advance and promote a meaningful role for the arts in the lives of individuals, families, and communities throughout the United States. In partnership with the endowment, we can broaden participation in the arts and build support from all sectors for the groups and individuals that make the arts available. Chairman Ivey, we want you to know that with ongoing communication that has already begun, you can count on us to work with you cooperatively to develop new and flexible approaches to accomplishing our shared goals. We're absolutely delighted that you've chosen to address our annual meeting and the City Club of Portland. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm NASA, Oregon, Portland, and City Club welcome to Chairman Bill Ivey. Thank you all. Thanks. 
<laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here in Portland with members of the National Assembly of uh, State Arts Agencies and also with members of the, of the City Club and also to have an opportunity to speak via radio and television to uh, citizens of, uh, of Oregon and uh, of Portland. It's especially good to be here to celebrate NASA's 30th anniversary. Uh, I congratulate all of our state partners in the arts and uh, add a special thank you for three decades of working with the endowment to build a strong infrastructure supporting the arts all across the nation. You know, this was a, a daunting speech today. I'm talking to three different audiences, uh, three distinct audiences, on Friday the 13th. <laughs> um, for members of the City Club, and for those of you who will ultimately be viewing at home or listening on the radio, let me make just a few preliminary points that I think are always worth, worth making. The National Endowment for the Arts is our federal agency charged with bringing music, dance, theater, literature, and painting, bringing the arts to the American people. The NEA helps preserve America's living cultural heritage and nurtures our nation's creativity. We convene meetings, we conduct research, publish studies and guides, but your endowment is best known for giving grants to arts organizations, grants to organizations all over the country. This year, for example, Oregon received support from the NEA through 11 direct and 76 indirect grants. The endowment's budget for 1999 will be $98 million, which is not enough. About 40% of those funds, of our grant funds, will go directly to the states. So Oregon received this year just about $460,000 through our state partnership program. NASA, which you'll hear me refer to, not the Space Agency, which is the National Assembly of State Arts Agency, the organization of all of America's state arts organizations are meeting here in Portland. It's a great pleasure to be with them. Now you may remember, all of you in this room remember, that the NEA has been at times controversial. And there was a time which the endowment was very nearly phased out. However, the American people, through the leadership of many in this room, let our political leaders know that we want, our citizens want and need, our federal arts agency. So the endowment has a proud heritage of service to the American people. And today it's my pleasure to talk with leaders and citizens of Portland and Oregon and to the membership of NASA, again not the space agency, about the future of NEA. So today I'm going to address three primary issues. First, talk a bit about my vision for the arts and how they work in our democratic society. Second, the endowment strategy for serving the American public in the next decade. And third, the significant role that you, our state partners, can play in the endowment's national vision. Now, from my very first few weeks as chairman of the NEA, I knew that in order to lead this agency beyond the controversy that had plagued it for the past 10 years, I needed to accomplish two immediate tasks. First, I needed to articulate a vision for the arts in America, one that can build a strong, lasting federal commitment to artists, arts organizations, and service to our citizens. This vision had to be clear and positive so that every American citizen would understand how central our creativity and cultural heritage are to our, our civil society. The National Endowment for the Arts must never again be in the situation in which one controversial grant can threaten to destroy the entire agency. Now second, to make the best use of our limited resources, I needed to connect our vision with a strategy, complete ultimately with measurable goals and measurable outcomes. So let me begin with the first of those, talk a bit about the arts and democracy and creativity. I'll begin by sharing this vision. Many of you know uh, that I'm a folklorist. There are many of my folklore colleagues that are, who are attending this meeting. And one of the things that folklorists understand is that artistic expression 
is absolutely central to the lives of both individuals and communities. I see art, as a folklore sees art, art and life as strands of the same cloth, woven together so tightly they're inseparable. And for the folklorist, the arts present us with, with a sense of how people communicate, how they connect, how they come together. It's a true window into the way communities live. Societies carry collective memory in their art, in their customs and ceremonies and myths and legends, and they use the arts as a vehicle to transfer values and traditions from one generation to the next. So through artistic expression, communities create a kind of cultural identity as their members tell stories and sing songs and paint images. And it is through their art that they communicate to the world their beliefs and hopes and dreams. For us, for us Americans, the arts and creative expression are especially important in our complex democratic society. A society which offers equal participation to hundreds of different cultural traditions, different cultural identities and personalities. This promise of equality translates into, for us, an endless process of negotiation and accommodation that at times can tear at the very fabric of our civil society. But the arts clearly represent a place where the democratic dream of blending and borrowing and sharing can really work. With art, ideas can flow freely in a guilt-free environment across cultural barriers. And it is this great democratic process of making art that has produced some of our greatest gifts to the world, from modern dance to abstract expressionism to rock and roll and country music. Now, the very concept of American art is a difficult one. Because American art, like America itself, is not one thing but many. Unlike some European nations that can at times claim a single national artistic culture, in our society far too many cultural traditions stand side by side to allow such a conceit. But even though we don't claim a single national culture, we do possess a great national arts process that I referred to earlier, a process of borrowing and sharing and of shaping entirely new art forms from the intersection of communities and ideas. And here's how that process works. And many of you have observed it. The combination of ballet and, and theater gives us modern dance. Ballet and jazz gives us modern dance. A blending of English folk song and Afri African American blues and gospel music produced country music. Uh, the mix of vaudeville and opera gave us America's musical theater. And that process of blending and accommodation and innovation demands the application of some of the key democratic principles on which this nation was founded. Tolerance and generosity and fairness, opportunity, freedom of expression, equality and justice. So in a sense, these values end up embedded in the very work of artists and are at one with this unique arts process that we possess. But what's the value of this arts process to our citizen? Above all, I believe the arts at work in our democracy demonstrate and reinforce the creativity of our people. And it's that national creativity that has made our nation the economic, scientific, and military giant that it is today. I guess it's sometimes called American ingenuity. But just think about what American creativity has accomplished in this century from the invention of automobiles and airplanes to placing a man on the moon, uh, curing a disease like polio, America is unquestionably the most diverse and prolific and innovative nation on Earth. And it's America's irrepressible creative spirit that keeps us inventing new and different ways of looking at ourselves and the world. So this nat national creative spirit is something that we must nurture and preserve. And I think it's, it is this special charge that falls squarely in the realm of the charge of the National Endowment for the Arts. We are that unique federal agency that works at the special place where living tradition touches the hand of the creative artist. And at the NEA, we improve the lives of American citizens by making certain that our nation's creativity is linked to our living cultural heritage. And no other agency of government can make that claim. Now, some of you may have heard me quoted, even this morning I said this, saying that uh, I believe the Arts Endowment should have equal importance to the Department of Defense. And it should. 
And while I would, uh, I would cheerfully accept their budget, <laughs> but I mean perhaps in a more important sense that I envision a nation that recognizes the central importance of our creative life to our nation's future well-being and security, a nation where the commitment to a kind of internal defense, that which makes us creative and strong, lets us talk to one another, that commitment is equal to our dedication to external defense against any enemy that might appear outside our borders. So to me, the federal role in nurturing the arts, which inclu includes preserving heritage and maintaining creativity, is not an option or a frill or something just for fun. It's essential to our democratic form of government. And so to me, support for the arts becomes an act of deep patriotism. So creativity and living cultural heritage, values, uh, and a strong, uh, a strong nation, a strong creative nation, I think are the ideas that come together around my vision for the arts in, in this country. And here's the way in which I think we could translate that vision into, into action. I think it requires a, a look at strategic plan and needs to be based on specific goals. So let me tell you what some of those goals are. First, we at the endowment believe that the American public should have access to a wide range of arts experiences. All Americans should have access to the arts, and the endowment is working to improve that access. Partly we're doing it with technology to extend our own audience. We've recently launched a redesigned website that brings more arts information and cultural experiences to a, to a broader audience. And we also take very seriously the administration's view, the Clinton-Gore administration's view, that the federal government and its agencies exist to serve the American people. Through our pilot program, Arts Reach, we've targeted endowment grants to organizations in 20 states that have been underrepresented in our direct grants program. And back in September, we announced our first grants to 84 organizations. Those grants will sponsor projects ranging from city design and cultural festivals to arts education and cultural publications. Now we're very grateful to the state arts agencies, to all of you in those target states, for your help in making this program a great success. And as our budget grows, which it will, we plan to target more NEA funds to underrepresented areas, not only underrepresented states, but underrepresented areas within states. We're also working with state and regional arts agencies to provide broader access for audiences all over the country. Uh, two months ago, I had the opportunity to announce support for touring performances in 141 Midwestern communities through the Heartland Fund. We're also working with NASA to update the 700-page publication Design for Accessibility Guide, which is the most comprehensive access guide for, for cultural groups dealing with disabled audiences and artists. And I'm happy to announce that the Humanities Endowment has joined in this project and will print copies of our access guide for all of the all NEH grantees. Now second, we believe that artists and organizations should have numerous opportunities to create and present artistic work. All creative work begins with the individual. While the endowment right now is prohibited from making most direct grants to individual artists, I believe it is important that we continue our commitment to artists in other ways while we rebuild our ability to, to grant funds directly. Through artist residencies supported by grants to organizations, through commissioning, and through fellowship grants made by you in your capacity as state arts agencies, we will continue to nurture individual creative artists. It's something that we must do because it is absolutely the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Another of the NEA programs that works with both artists and arts organizations uh, to help them create is Open Studio, the Arts Online, which is a cooperative project the NEA uh, developed with the Benton Foundation and with the advice and help of NASA and its members. This project has 10 training sites throughout the country and aims to have a system of up to two internet access sites in every state and territory. Open Studio trains artists and arts organizations to use the internet. And through this program, we hope to increase the cultural presence of arts all over the internet and 
to introduce new audiences and artists uh, to the arts and the process of making art in a digital realm. Third, we believe the arts play a central role in our nation's education system and in lifelong learning for its citizens. We are committed to putting the arts back into the basic curriculum of our school systems, beginning with preschool. Right. <clears throat> putting them back into our curriculum, basic curriculum, beginning with preschool and continuing with required courses for high school graduation and beyond. If we are to maintain our creativity and nourish our cultural heritage, we must begin by engaging our children in the arts. Just this past Tuesday, I had the pleasure of joining Secretary of Education Riley to announce the results of the first nation's report card on the arts in 20 years. This project was an assessment of what our nation's eighth graders know and are able to do in the arts. It, it assessed their ability to interpret, to perform, and to create in a variety of artistic medium. It was a very interesting project. While we found a number of challenges, one of the most positive findings was something that those of us in the arts have known intuitively for years, that create, creativity can be nurtured and it can be taught. We know perhaps great artists are born with innate talent, but given the right opportunities, and that should surely include rigorous sequential instruction in the arts, all students can increase their creativity and rise to a high level of expectations. The national assessment results also tell us that a combination of in-school and out-of-school engagement in artistic activity leads to greater understanding and heightened ability in both performance and creation. But in this report card, our eighth graders did not do well. What was absolutely clear was that we simply must put arts education back into our schools so that all children have a chance to develop their imaginations and their creative abilities. Now fourth, we at the endowment believe it is imperative that our nation's cultural heritage be preserved and documented and conveyed to future generations. Much of our work in preserving and promoting America's traditional cultural heritage is made possible by a network of state arts or agencies and other statewide organizations. Through our folk and traditional infra infrastructure initiative, a model initiative developed by the NEA with the help of NASA, we're work working to strengthen and extend this essential network. This is an area in which our mutual efforts over many years have truly made a difference. In another area of preservation, the endowment is working in partnership with Target Stores and Save Outdoor Sculpture on a White House Millennium Project to preserve public sculpture in every state. And I'd also like to mention the Favorite Poem Project, another Millennium Initiative in which Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky will create an online archive of Americans reading their favorite poems. And I know you're looking forward to getting a chance to hear the very inspiring Robert Pinsky in person later in your conference. Uh, fifth, we want to ensure that America's cultural organizations in the 21st century possess organizational strength and financial stability, all that's required to help them realize their goals. The Arts Endowment has begun a year-long study to determine how best to deploy NEA resources to ensure the long-term health of America's arts organizations. And in fact, we recognize the major role that the state arts agencies play in supporting arts organizations with, I guess, about 50% of your grant funds going to operating support alone. We also recognize the remarkable skill and initiative that has led to the creation of statewide endowment funds, which serve as an important strategy to support arts organizations in several states. Now, as we undertake this study, we will certainly be looking to all of you for ideas and also for models. Now, sixth, we believe that the arts are central to the realization of community dreams, something that's very close to the work of so many of you. The civic and governmental leaders in this audience know firsthand about the many positive benefits of making sure that the arts community is involved in city planning and design. Besides anchoring communities, growing the economy, and increasing jobs, the, art gives com the arts give communities identity, a sense of shared pride, and a way to communicate across cultural boundaries. Investing in the arts 
actually ends up being an investment in people and communities. To demonstrate the tremendous asset artists can be to towns and cities, we're working with state and regional organizations on Artists and Communities, America Creates for the Millennium. During the year 2000, in each state, issues important to an underserved community will be addressed through a model artist residency. And then the impact of these projects will be documented, publicized, the results will be shared. The endowment is also involved in Continental Harmony, a millennium initiative which will place composers in communities, a very exciting project. And they'll write musical compositions for over a year-long residency for special historical community events. Finally, I want to talk about pursuing partnerships. We have a vision that clearly connects what we do at the endowment, that is promoting excellence and diversity and vitality in the arts, with what our nation has accomplished in the past and will accomplish in the future, that is our living cultural heritage and our national creativity. We have translated our vision for the arts in America into, into a workable plan that links our goals and strategies to measurable outcomes and to our resources to our budget request. And this is the first time the endowment has ever uh, created a strategic plan which flows into a budget, which produces measurable outcomes. And uh, I think it will be very helpful to us as we address both the White House and Congress with our, our appropriations request for the year 2000. So how are we going to accomplish our goals? And I think this is where you, our state partners, and you, our civic leaders, will play a crucial role. I believe today, more than ever, the key to accomplishing our vision, to achieving our vision in the arts is through partnerships at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. And by working to develop partnerships with other sectors of society, partnerships are critical to developing a support structure for arts and communities. And I'm committed to developing those partnerships on all levels, private citizens, arts organizations, and artists, governors, mayors, civic leaders, business leaders, teachers, and school administrators. Now, at the federal level, we have already made some great strides in expanding our partnerships with other agencies, particularly in the areas of youth at risk, arts education, and heritage and preservation. I'll mention just a few, which I think, I think some of these will impact you in the states. Last month, we joined uh, with the First Lady and the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities in presenting the Coming Up Taller Awards to 10 arts programs which serve as national models for after-school arts activity. We will be working closely with the Department of Education to ensure that community arts organizations have full access to the new $200 million appropriation for 21st century community schools grants for after schools program. I think this is a very exciting program that will affect many of you that's, that's coming down the line. In September, the First Lady held a symposium on the power of the arts in education in which she recognized the outstanding contributions of the Goals 2000 Arts Education Partnership. And this recent assessment that was only announced the other day, I think, is a result of, of that arts education partnership. We appreciate NASA's cooperation and partnership in that successful national initiative. And we certainly appreciate the important work that each of you are doing to advance the arts in education. Now in January, we will be announcing the Mars Millennium Project, an exciting national arts, science, and technology education partnership involving the US Department of Education, the Arts Endowment, the Getty Trust, and NASA, the Space Agency. Uh, <laughs> Through important projects like this one, the endowment hopes to bring national recognition to the vital role of the arts in developing creativity, creativity and imagination in young people. We've also been working closely with the Department of Transportation to develop a Millennium Heritage Trails project. And I'm pleased that NASA, the state arts organization, has agreed to join the NEA and the Department of Transportation to produce a booklet that will highlight model arts projects across the nation that have been sponsored by transportation funds. And it's, that booklet will also indicate how individual states can, can get access to these Department of Transportation funds. And I'm also personally committed to developing partnerships with the commercial sector, particularly linking 
the work of the endowment uh, and, uh, and private funders with the, uh, with the entertainment, recording, and publishing industries. Not only do these industries own great portions of our cultural heritage, but they, they possess the resources and expertise to work closely with nonprofit organizations on important preservation and other cultural projects. Now, I'll close with an important new initiative that we're just beginning to talk with all of you about. A few weeks ago, during a meeting at my office in Washington with NASA leaders, one of the questions posed was how can state arts agencies support the NEA and vice versa? Now, one small thing we talked about was simply recognition for the endowment's work, for its presence in, in, in your activities. And this week, I signed a memo, which many of you either have received or will be receiving within days, requesting that the NEA receive formal acknowledgment for our participation in the work we support through our state and regional partners. But the most important way you can help the Arts Endowment is by supporting a, a major new funding proposal we will be presenting to Congress in January. I mentioned how we've linked vision and strategic plan with measurable outcomes. But a part of that budget is a major new initiative, an initiative which is a challenge to individuals, families, communities, schools, governments, businesses, and institutions to form partnerships to support the central role of the arts in our nation's creative life, its creative life, its community spirit, cultural legacy. We want the state arts agencies and regional arts organizations to be our primary partners in this initiative. So we are requesting that 40% of all new funds be used to expand our partnership with you so we can work together to accomplish three goals. First, protect and share America's living cultural heritage. Second, enhance American creativity. And third, strengthen families, communities, and our nation through the arts. Now this is a major new initiative and I need your help to make it happen. But first let me tell you what I'm going to do. Beginning early next year, I will try to meet with every member of Congress. I've been told it's impossible. I'm going to try to meet with every member of Congress and I'll speak to mayors and governors, county officials, educators, and business and civic leaders about the importance of this initiative and the presence of the arts in our everyday lives. But obviously, I cannot do this alone. I need your help. You're the arts experts in your states and the, art, and the experts on your states. I need you to speak to your governors, speak to your state legislators, let them know how important the federal-state partnership is in the arts in your community, in your state, in your own family. Talk to them about nurturing and protecting our nation's living cultural heritage, enhancing the creativity of our children, and strengthening our families and our cities. Together, we can make the arts central to the lives of every American and move this initiative uh, to fruition. So today, I've asked for your support and help as we work together to challenge American communities to build partnerships and expand understanding about the vital role of the arts in maintaining our national creativity and preserving our heritage. The timing for this new initiative could not be better. We're coming to the end of one century, looking forward to beginning a new one, what better time to sum up our achievements in the arts, our cultural heritage and legacy, and really plan for the creative beginning of a new century. To carry our cultural legacy forward, I want you to know that I am personally committed to ensuring that the Arts Endowment forges the most effective partnerships ever with our state arts agencies, civic business and government leaders, arts organizations, and educators across this nation. And the benefactors of our close partnership will ultimately be our customers, this administration's customers, the American people. So again, I congratulate NASA, not the Space Agency, on three decades of outstanding service to the American public. I'm excited about the prospects of what we can accomplish together and look forward to working closely with each of you over the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate it. Uh,
Thank you. Um, I understand the first question. Please lay it lay it on me, as they say. Well, I'm very honored to ask the first question as a member of City Club, but I'm thinking back a few years to when I was a member of NASA, representing the Oregon Arts Commission. Um, my prepared question you basically already answered in your oh. talk, so I'm winging it here. Um, one of the problems that we saw some years ago from the State Arts Agency point of view was a lack of name recognition for our State Arts Agencies and for the National Endowment for the Arts. I don't think um, that a name recognition for the NEA is any longer a problem. Um, however, we may have a different problem, which I think we're, we're coming uh, to a new era of uh, finding the positive side. What I'm hoping is that uh, you can give us some ideas for how the NEA can take its uh, uh, notoriety and help publicize the positive partnerships that you are building and help open doors for those of us in communities and states to form these partnerships with non-arts related uh, government agencies and, and corporations and organizations. Um, yeah, I do think the, uh, the Arts Endowment has one of the most recognized brand names in, uh, in federal government. You know, I think we're up there with uh, FBI, IRS, <laughs> NASA, the Space Agency. And, uh, and, and then NEA, you know, 15 years ago, NEA was the National Education Association, and now it's the National Endowment for the Arts. And so we have built uh, somewhat, sometimes uh, uh, without, our, without any effort on our own part, we've built terrific uh, brand recognition. And I do think that not-for-profit organizations in general, and I think the endowment in a sense works as our kind of government not-for-profit, have powerful brand names in our society. And you think of the Museum of Modern Art, or. Uh, the National Geographic Society, or uh, uh, you know, the New York Philharmonic. These are very, these are in many cases very powerful brand names, and I, I hope that all of all of the arts organizations who put so much energy into developing these brands uh, protect them well, and because it's a it's a these are major corporate assets. I think that in forming alliances, both with agencies of government with the private sector, one of the key challenges is to establish value. I think this relates to uh, the question about whether the NEA is notorious or famous. I think we've gone from an era of notoriety, perhaps we're easing back into, into fame, in which uh, our, our good works, which in numbers so overwhelm any, uh, any uh, activity that's given anyone a problem, uh, when, when, when the numerical weight of our good works uh, again rises to, uh, to define the character of, of the agency. But you know, when I talk about the arts, in America, when I talk about the centrality of uh, creativity and living cultural heritage, my goal is to try to build over time the kind of conceptual foundation for talking about the arts in society that, uh, that will establish their centrality and give us all good value when we walk into the office of someone who might be initially uh, either uh, uninterested or even hostile to the inclusion of an arts agenda in their work. So I think having a sense of value, a sense of the importance and centrality of what we do is a starting point for all of these negotiations. I do think it will be worthwhile over the next few years to kind of inventory the, uh, the assets of the not-for-profit cultural world because I do think there are some things, brand names, collections, staff expertise, in which the not-for-profit world in general Excels, and many of you work with not-for-profit organizations in your states and see this value. I think as we begin to move all of the arts into a digital age, the ability of, uh, of the tax-exempt arts to have a sense of all of the, uh, of the value of their inventory in order to negotiate with, other ag with agencies of government or with the for-profit sector, I think it's, it's going to be very important. So I think establish value and, ex and assess our assets and then go forth and, and make the very best arrangements that we can. Another question, where are the microphones? Oh, there's one, all right, right here. Matteo Lucio, new member of the City Club and managing editor of the public affairs magazine, Oregon's Future. Uh, Chairman Ivey, uh, many, probably most, um, I mean, most probably uh, all of the other advanced industrial nations have uh, culture and arts uh, ministries and agencies and so forth. 
What's unique about this country is the plethora of private foundations funding, among other things, the arts. Most of the things you listed are also funded by private foundations. So what is the special mission of the National Endowment of the Arts uh, in funding and in representing uh, the art community in this country as opposed to what is done by uh, funding through private foundations? Yeah. Uh, I, that's a good question. I think that uh, you know, even, even were we to realize all of our dreams in terms of the level of federal support for the arts, I think we would have to admit that that, that support would always be uh, a small to medium part of the overall picture, which would include earn, earned income and donations from individuals and foundations and corporations and so on that makes up the whole matrix, as well as other levels of, of government uh, that, that, that play into the that, that play into the picture. I think you, you, you answered, uh, th th there was an idea embedded in your question, and it was something that uh, a woman named Stephanie Franks, who works with the, the uh, uh, Philip Morris Foundation in New York City, said almost in passing one day when I was visiting with her, and she said, you know, if we, if we didn't have a national endowment, there really wouldn't be a sense of a national art scene. And I think that that is a, one role that the endowment has played over the years in developing a sense of an arts community. The, uh, the endowment, I think, is a, is a voice saying that even in uh, a society that honors diversity, almost to the point at times of fragmentation, there is a national uh, honoring of our arts process that in a sense brings us together the way uh, around the, the way in which we uh, uniquely make art in the society. I think also the, the NEA has the ability to be strategic in some important ways, both in convening around topics of national interest and in going out and targeting specific projects that are uh, exemplary, that can, be model, that can be models for activities in other areas, and, uh, and also in, in, in working with activities and organizations whose reach doesn't fit neatly within other funding boundaries, that is either the boundaries of a state, the boundaries of a region, a city, or even within the area of interest of an individual foundation that tend to be rather targeted. So while we are always going to be part of the mix, uh, I think there's a very, very important ongoing federal role that uh, as we grow the, uh, the national investment in the arts, that that federal role should grow along with all the other, uh, other components. Not, yes, sir. Yeah. Chairman Ivey, I'm Chester Bowles from uh, New Hampshire, a member of the State Council of the Arts there. Uh, I have a, somewhat of a philosophical uh, dilemma I'd like to ask you a question about. Uh -oh. given, <laughs> given the uh, somewhat uh, small nature of the funds we have to grant to organizations, uh, I'd just like some thoughts from you about what makes more sense. Do we continue to offer many grants to uh, uh, organizations with a smaller amount of money or smaller grants to, uh, or I'm sorry, but uh, larger grants to a smaller number of uh, groups. That's not as philosophical as I would have liked, actually. <laughs> that's pretty practical. <laughs> that's actually pretty practical. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's not a question that has a single answer because if uh, one of the things that the endowment has learned, and I know that each of you working with the states has also learned that, uh, that support has to be tailored to the needs of the different communities that you serve. And you know, what works for a dance company might not work for a symphony orchestra, might not work for a folk arts ensemble or a, or a Native American tribe. And uh, I think in some cases we have found that as the endowment has had to rework its own strategies with a budget reduced from what it had some years back, that it's been able to, uh, to have a real impact with a large number of smaller grants. And I think in other areas there's a longing for smaller, a smaller number of grants, the larger amount of, of, of dollars. I think one of the, one of the programs you know, I miss the, the, the programs I miss the most are the, are the real big ones, that is sort of challenge and advancement, that tended in some cases to uh, allow big organizations to receive lar fairly large amounts of money from the endowment. 
Uh, and I also miss the ones at the very bottom, the, the, the grants to individual artists that sometimes did not involve very many dollars but had also had a huge impact. So I don't want to seem to be dodging the question, but I don't think our experience is that, there, that there's a simple answer, that it's just one way or another. I think it has to be targeted strategically to the needs of, uh, of the specific organizations. And frankly, I'm hoping that it's, this is just a passing problem, you know, and that, and that within, a, within a matter of months, we'll be talking about a budget that isn't what we want, but is a lot closer to where we should be than, than we are right now. I'm Bennett Charlton, director of the Tennessee Arts Commission. <laughs> Within the context of your remarks about building partnerships between the not-for-profit sector and the for-profit sector, and within the context of your own background of being the director of a not-for-profit, large not-for-profit organization that worked very closely with the for-profit recording industry and, and, and similar uh, organizations, would you talk about some of the points where those uh, two sectors have some common mutual uh, context and contact and, and intersection and maybe two or three of the areas in which we may find that they do not often con uh, sure. connect? Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, wh when I came in uh, to the chairmanship, uh, one of the ideas I brought with me was the importance of connecting the for-profit and not-for-profit sector. In Nashville, Tennessee, the Country Music Foundation had had a long history of working very closely and effectively with the for-profit, primarily the for-profit recording industry in Nashville. And uh, I'll, I'll mention in a minute some of the ways in which that entity worked with uh, work with the for-profit sector, but since I've been chairman, uh, I, I, I frankly have seen that the, the, the problems of connecting the two worlds are perhaps a little more daunting than I had realized coming out of, out of an environment in which in our little micro uh, uh, setting, the, the cooperation worked extraordinarily well. In looking through, you know, if, if, if you I mentioned in, in, another, in, in, in another context the value that, uh, of, of not-for-profit uh, trade, uh, trademarks, the, the terrific uh, collections assets that not-for-profits have, and the staff expertise that tends to be present in many not-for-profit organizations. I think there are assets there that ultimately can make for a strong connection between uh, cultural not-for-profits and the for-profit sector. But on the, on the face of it, let me mention two areas where I think there's a possibility of cooperation. Uh, one would be in the area of dealing with what I call the external environment. That is, both for-profit and not-for-profit arts entities are trying, are struggling to make a, uh, a successful transition into an, an age in which some kind of digital technology is going to stand between uh, the creator and the audience for artistic endeavor. And I think that that is challenging both sectors equally. I don't think anyone really has a handle on it. If they tell you they do, they're probably uh, lying. And, uh, and, and I think that there are some real challenges and also some, some ways in which uh, the not-for-profit sector, I think, is particularly strong in, in approaching the digital age, partly because they do control in many cases, collections and have a lot of staff expertise and have good brand names. All of all three of which work very well in a digital uh, in a digital environment. I do think also the regulatory realm is one in which the for-profit and not-for-profit sectors can work together. Even though not-for-profit organizations are somewhat less regulated, uh, they too operate in an environment uh, of involving taxation issues, uh, uh, intellectual property questions. Uh, union, uh, you know, labor, a, a broad range of labor issues, and again, I think that's a, a, an area in which the two sectors could easily find common ground. And I think there are some areas in which they're very, very far apart in a sense, but they can also find ways of working together. This is what happened with us in Nashville. The Country Music Foundation ha had a large research library in addition to its museum, the Country Music Hall of Fame. And over about a 15-year period, that library and its staff uh, produced about 125 uh, historical reissue recordings for the commercial industry, many of which were very successful. And this had to do with taking the knowledge of the staff, the collections of that library, 
and using them to create, reissue CDs that would ultimately be released on, on, on a major label. So you had uh, the Country Music Foundation serving as a producer of historical product for the commercial labels that didn't have the time or the resources to staff up to deal with these historical materials themselves. It was a perfect uh, uh, area of cooperation. But that's one where the two were not immediately close. They worked together because they were very far apart. They, the, the industry did not have uh, the time or the money f to develop a deep commitment and understanding of its own historical resources. And so it turned to the Country Music Foundation. And in this area, the two were rather far apart but found a way to work together. So I think there are probably four or five uh, areas of possible cooperation, but I think we have to move very cautiously because uh, those are big, some big companies out there. Uh, we are mostly mission driven. They are, uh, they are charged with increasing a, s a shareholder value and uh, those two goals are sometimes not completely compatible, but I think there are great opportunities uh, if we move in a nice, steady, slow fashion. Were you, you a question? All right. I've been obsessed by the Where's Waldo image of you wandering about the halls of Congress. Um, <laughs> well, look, we don't do it that way. We actually go straight, straight to their office. And I was wondering what kinds of strategic thinking you've put to telling people what they don't want to know and getting them to listen to what they don't want to hear. Well, that's, that's a great question, yeah. We put a lot, you know, um, Far, far from wandering the, uh, the halls of Congress uh, like a lost soul, uh, Dick Woodruff, who is our congressional liaison, organizes things very tightly. And uh, I, I tend to go directly into an office and talk and then leave quickly. But, uh, <laughs> but we do. We, for the first time, you know, there are several things that the endowment is doing that I think are going, that will help us enormously in addition to what we know you are going to do uh, to, to, uh, to assist in our effort. We have a strategic plan that we're going to have in a very condensed form so we can walk into uh, the office of a member of Congress and say, here, here's our plan. If you invest in this agency, here are the outcomes you can expect. Uh, second, we have a much better handle than we've ever had in the past on the real impact of endowment grants in every locality. You notice in my, early in my remarks, I mentioned that, that we gave 11 direct and 76 indirect grants to the state of Oregon. Well, those, in those 76 indirect grants are radio broadcasts, touring companies, the kinds of effort that we were not able to track in the past. Also, because we're going to be working more closely with, with our state partners, we're going to have a much better sense of what you do and exactly how that connects with individual districts. And uh, we're going to basically walk in with a stronger, a stronger case, uh, a vision, support materials from our strategic plan and a real sense of the impact of our work on the district of every member uh, with whom I speak. And I think we will be armed uh, in a much better way than we have been than we have been in the past. And you know, the, the effort to save the endowment, the successful effort to save the endowment, made everybody smarter, better organized than, than they've ever been in the past. Our hope is now that we can take the skills that were learned in a battle for survival and use those same skills to move the entire agenda forward. And I think that internally the endowment is smarter than ever. I know you are all smarter and more organized than ever. So I think we should have uh, every, every uh, opportunity for, for success. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ivey. Thank you, members of City Club, and to our special guests this afternoon. We are adjourned.